Hilchas Kiddush HaChodesh, Perik Yud Dalid, and Tesvav. This class is dedicated to the Refuah Shlema of Sheina Chaya Bas Michal. At the heart of all of these Prakim and Rambam is essentially one question. Will the moon be visible in the sky on the night following the Meilat? The answer to this question is reached by figuring out where the sun is on its orbit, where the moon is on its orbit, and the distance between them. If the moon has gotten far enough from the sun, then after the sun sets below the horizon, the moon will still be visible in the sky and be able to be seen by witnesses. If not, then the moon will not be able to be visible. However, as the Rambam teaches us, it's not just enough to figure out where the sun and the moon are on their own orbits. That will only give you the makim ha'em tzoi, the average position of the sun and the moon. Since the sun and the moon's orbit are off-center relative to the earth, to the observer looking out from the surface of earth, he will see the sun and the moon at different degrees than from the center of their own orbit. That is called the makim ha'amiti, the true position of the sun and the moon, the degree in the Galgal Hamazoles where we see the sun and the moon from earth. To reach this makim ha'amiti, a number of corrections have to be made to the makim ha'em tsoi, to the average position of the sun and the moon. In the last class, covering Perek Yud Bez and Yud Gimel, we learned about the corrections to the sun. We figure out where the sun is in its own orbit. We figure out where the goiva, the furthest point of the sun's orbit from earth, is. We figure out the distance between them. And then we follow the table in Perek Yud Gimel that the Ramam gave us to adjust the Mokim Ho'em Tsoi of the Shemesh to the Mokim Ho'amiti of the Shemesh. It's simple and straightforward. However, when it comes to the moon, it's much more complex. As the Rambam says in the end of Perek Akalkales Gedoyles Yesh B'Magaloisav. The moon has great deviations, a lot of incongruities in its orbit. And so to reach the Mokim Ha'amiti of the moon takes many, many more corrections. Let's start with this. We've mentioned a number of times in these classes that the moon moves on its own orbit, eastward, counterclockwise, at a rate of 13 degrees per day. But the truth is, as the Rambam tells us in the beginning of Perek Yudalid, it's a bit more complicated than that. Besides for the circular journey that the moon is making around the earth, it's also hopping around in a mini circle, a galgal koton, or in English it's called an epicycle. When we say the moon moves 13 degrees per day, we mean the center point of that epicycle moves 13 degrees along the circumference of the larger orbit. The moon itself, however, can be anywhere on that epicycle, behind or in front of that center point. The location of the center of the epicycle on the larger orbit is called in the Rambam the Emsa Hayoreach. The location of the moon on the epicycle itself is called in the Rambam the Emsa Hamaslo. Ultimately, to reach the moon's true position, we have to correct the distance between the Emsa Hayoreach and the Emsa Hamaslo. That correction is actually given by the Rambam in the end of Perek Tesvav. But first, during Perek Yudalid and the beginning of Perek Tesvav, the Rambam makes two more corrections. A correction to the Emtza Hayareach relative to itself and a correction to the Emtza Hamaslo relative to itself. In other words, before we can correct the distance between the two, we need to know the precise position of each one respectively. And as we will see, both the Emtza Hayareach and the Emtza Hamaslo require a bit of correction. What exactly needs adjustment here? Well, at the beginning of this class, I said that the heart of all of Kiddush HaChedesh is one question. Will the moon be visible in the sky after sunset on the night following the Meilat? But if you remember in the introductory class, I said that all the calculations in Kiddush HaChedesh presume an equal 24-hour day with sunset always being at 6 p.m. So if our calculations tell us that the moon at sunset will be at a certain position, we essentially only know the moon's position for 6 p.m. This is a bit problematic because in Yerushalayim, where the sighting of the moon actually mattered, sunset is not always at 6 p.m. It varies from day to day. In the summer months, when the sun is in the northern hemisphere, Shkia is later. In the winter months, when the sun is in the southern hemisphere, Shkia is earlier. So if I know the moon's position for 6 p.m., but sunset is at 7, that's not going to be helpful. Because at 6 p.m. it's still day. And the moon, no matter how far it is from the sun, will not be able to be seen. 
I have to know where the Emtza Hayareach, where the moon will be at 7 p.m. The same holds true in the opposite way for the winter. If sunset is at 5, knowing where the moon is going to be at 6 is not helpful. Because at 6 p.m., the moon will already be below the horizon. No matter how far it is from the sun, I won't be able to see it. I have to know where the moon's going to be at 5 o'clock. And so, in the last two halachas of Perek Yudalid, the Rambam gives us the correction that has to be made. Depending on the time of year, you might have to subtract or add to the position of Emtza HaYardeach. What you're left with after that subtraction or addition, after that correction, is called Emtza HaYardeach Lish'as Hare'iya. The moon's average position for the time of sighting. By the way, the Rambam calls the time of sighting not sunset itself, but about 20 minutes after sunset. But the point is the same. This is the adjustment for Emtza HaYardeach. In Perek Tezvav, the Rambam moves on to the correction of Emtza HaMaslo, correcting the moon's position on its epicycle. The Rambam doesn't explain what needs correction, he just describes how to do the correction. This is what he says. Find the Emtza HaShemesh, find the sun's position on its orbit, and then find the Emtza HaYareach Lishas Hare'iya, the position of the center of the moon's epicycle for the time of sighting, as we just explained. The distance between them should be doubled. That's called the Merchak HaKofel, the double distance. Depending on how big this double distance is, a certain small amount should be added to the Emtza HaMaslul, which leads you to the Maslul HaNochim, the correct position of the moon on its epicycle. Now what's wrong with the Emtza HaMaslul that it has to be corrected? And how does the Merchak HaKofel help anything? The Rambam, as I said, doesn't explain this. And it's discussed at length in the Mefarshia Rambam. With multiple approaches, both conforming to medieval and modern science. In this year, I'm going to present one approach, and I'll try to simplify it to the best of my ability. Take a close look at this slide. The outermost circle is the Galgal Hamazolis. That's why it's divided into 12 strips for the 12 groups of stars. Earth is in the center. The large inner circle represents the moon's orbit around the Earth. And the small circle represents the moon's epicycle. The black dot right near the Earth is the center of the moon's orbit. It's off-center relative to the Earth, as you can see. As we said, the entire epicycle moves along the circumference of the larger circle, and the moon itself is revolving within the epicycle. Now, we remember that circles are divided into 360 degrees. So, on the larger circle, the moon's orbit, we can see where zero degrees is. But what about the epicycle? It's constantly moving. How do we define where zero degrees is? When we say that the moon, let's say, is on 10 degrees of Emtza Hamaslo, 10 degrees relative to what? Where's the beginning point? So without getting into the details on this, just accept this as a matter of fact, with a moving circle, the point of zero degrees is always the point furthest from the observer. In the Mepharshim, this is called the Goiva of the Galgal Katan. The Goiva means the apogee, the highest point on the small circle. In this case, the observer is on Earth. So relative to Earth, the point on the epicycle that we will label as zero degrees is always the point furthest from it. By the way, even though the Earth is off-center, this rule holds true. As you can see here, as the epicycle slides around the Earth, zero degrees is always the furthest point. Now we understand how we can measure Emtza HaMaslo properly. If we know, for example, I said before, that Emtza HaMaslo was at zero degrees on one day, and the next day it's at 13 degrees, it means 13 degrees relative to the furthest point from the Earth. However, there's one small problem. And that is that besides for the epicycle moving along the larger orbit, the entire larger orbit is itself moving around the Earth. In opposite direction, by the way. The epicycle moves counterclockwise, the entire larger orbit moves clockwise. And without getting too complicated, once again, I'm just going to give you the fact. This movement, this movement that the larger orbit makes around the Earth causes that relative to Earth, the goiva of the epicycle, the point that's furthest from Earth, is always changing. If at the Moilid, let's say, it was at one point, by the time we get to the following sunset, it has slightly changed. Which means 
that if we know that from the Moilat, the moon advanced on Emtza HaMaslal, on its own path, it advanced 10 degrees, that would mean 10 degrees relative to the point that was the Goiva at the time of the Moilat. But relative to the point that is currently the Goiva, the distance will be slightly more. This is the correction that Mercha Kakofel comes to correct. How does this work? How does Mercha Kakofel help achieve this correction? So for this, we need to introduce another piece of background. Since the moon's larger orbit is off-center relative to Earth, that means that there's a distance between Earth and the center of the moon's orbit. Let's just call it 100 feet, for argument's sake. If we went to the other side of the Earth, the side that's further from the center of the moon's orbit, and we drew a line outwards, extending also 100 feet, we would reach the theoretical point that's called in mathematical svarim and in the Mefarshim here in Kedosh HaChedosh, it's called the Nekuda Hanaychichis, the equidistant point. The point that's as far from the Earth on this side as the center of the moon's orbit is from the Earth on the other side. The benefit of this point will become clear in a moment. This is the universe in Moilad position. We can see that everything here is aligned. The Emtza HaShemesh, the placement of the sun, the Emtza HaYareach, the center of the moon's epicycle, the Goiva of both the moon's epicycle and the moon's larger orbit, that means the point that are furthest from Earth, all of these things are all aligned. You can also see that the Nekudah HaNeichichis is in line with everything else. Let's take a look at what happens after one day. The Emtza HaShemesh, the sun in its orbit, moves about one degree per day. The Emtza HaYareach, the center of the moon's epicycle, moves about 13 degrees per day. Both of these movements are eastward, counterclockwise. The Goiva of the moon's larger orbit, the point of the moon's larger orbit that's furthest from the Earth, moves clockwise about 11 degrees per day. Fascinatingly, you can see that at the end of one day, the Emtza HaShemesh, the sun, is directly in between the Goiva of the moon and the Emtza HaYareach. In other words, the moon's progress minus the sun's progress is the same as the Goiva's progress plus the sun's progress. Or in easier words, the Merchak HaKofel, the double distance, is the distance between the Goiva of the moon's orbit and the Emtza HaYareach. Without getting into the trigonometric functions that prove this, the following is an automatic truth. If you draw a line from the Nekuda HaNoichichis through the center of the moon's epicycle all the way to the Emtza HaMaslul, you will hit the point on the epicycle that was the Goiva at the time of the Moilet. Hence, knowing the Mercha Kakofel corrects the Emtza HaMaslul. Because when you figure out the position of the Goiva of the moon's larger orbit, you automatically reach the Nekuda HaNeichichis, which will give you access to the Goiva of the epicycle, and you'll be able to correct the difference between the moon's current position on the Emtza HaMaslul relative to its Goiva at the time of the Moilet. And this correction yields what the Rambam calls the Maslul HaNochein. Once you have the Maslul HaNochein, we can proceed to correct the distance between Emtza HaYareach, L'Sha'a Sari'iya, and the Maslul HaNochein. And this, as the Rambam says in the end of Perek Tezvav, gives us the Mokim HaYareach HaAmiti, L'Sha'a Sari'iya, the moon's true position for the time of sighting. I'm going to close this year with one last comment on the Merchak HaKofel. The Rambam says in the beginning of Perek Tezvav that on the night of sighting, this double distance can be anywhere between 5 degrees and 62 degrees. Now, since Mercha Kakofel is double the distance between the sun and the moon, essentially what the Rambam is saying is that on the night of sighting, the distance between the Mokim of Emtza HaShemesh and Emtza HaYareach can be anywhere between 2.5 and 31 degrees. This is a major problem because in Perek Yud Zayin, the Rambam says that the distance between the sun and the moon on the night of sighting must be between 9 and 24 degrees, not 2 and 31. And the Mepharshim explain that it depends. In this Perek, Perek Tezvav, the Rambam is talking about not the true position, the Emtza HaShemesh 
and the Emtza Hayareach. As we will see in Perek Yudzayin, the maximum correction made to the sun's position will be two degrees, and the maximum correction made to the moon will be five degrees. This means that the maximum possible inaccuracy between the sun's and moon's average positions can be seven degrees. Interestingly, 2.5 degrees plus seven would be nine. 31 minus seven would be 24. Hence the Rambam writes in Perek Yudzayin, that there can only be a distance of 9 to 24 degrees.